An earthquake and a hurricane may have delayed this day, but this is a day that would not be denied. For this day, we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s return to the National Mall. Milwaukee at the King Memorial dedication. Next on Black Nouveau. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. On this edition, we'll hear from Milwaukeeans who attended the MLK dedication in Washington, D.C. and conclude our month-long discussion on breast cancer awareness. We'll explain the Food Step Challenge and profile a local artist who's also the subject of a new play premiering this weekend. But first, thousands of Americans attended the recent dedication of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, D.C. Black Nouveau followed a bus of Wisconsinites who joined the celebration. Everett Marshburn has more. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. With those words, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. emerged from the 1963 March on Washington as one of America's preeminent civil rights leaders. His speech not only stirred the thousands of March attendees, it echoed across the nation and the world. During the 60s and late 50s, this country was again to be split in two. Black versus white, haves versus the have-nots. And it was Dr. King who said we could live together as brothers. But it transcends America and that Dr. King's message really is international. No matter where you go in the world today, if there is unrest and unjust, people lock arms and start singing, we shall overcome. One of the March attendees was a 16-year-old Milwaukeean, Geraldine McGowan. I was in the National Council of Negro Women, the Youth Council, and we were asked to sell our lapel badges in the street to raise funds for the March on Washington. I was 16, and I think about 40 or 50 went to Washington, D.C., and we stayed in um, Mount Carmel Baptist Church, six blocks from the White House. I remember um, that speech that Dr. King uh, spoke about his dream and I was just burning inside, didn't know how to express myself, we were so happy, we were jumping for glee, because we never heard anything like that before. That's the first time I ever heard anything of that magnitude before. And to me, he was a hero. And so 48 years later, she went back to D.C. with a busload of Wisconsinites to celebrate the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the National Mall. The trip was sponsored by the Ambassadors for Peace Program and the Aracopa Coalition for Social Justice. Saturday's arrival in D.C. gave the Milwaukee contingent time to participate in the reenactment march and protest for jobs and economic equality. The group also met with Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Milwaukee's 4th Congressional District. That Milwaukee and your constituents support you 100 percent. That's right. Take a message back to our president All right. that we're not going to give in or give up. That's right. Absolutely. We're going to pass that jobs bill. Yeah. How are we going to pass the jobs bill? Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, she was here, she's 16 years old. Come over here and take a picture. Hey, come all on, right, all right. Come on, girlfriend. Go ahead, on. Come on, Go ahead, on. Oh, 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 <laughs> For without you and what we have collectively done together, we would not be able to participate in this truly one of the greatest moments in our history. On Sunday, Milwaukeeans joined thousands of other citizens for the official dedication. Hosted by PBS's Gwen Eiffel and with live coverage from C-SPAN and many other cable networks, attendees listened for hours to an array of speakers and performers. We marched through the streets yesterday in Washington 
We gave one message. You will not undo the King dream. You will not take away the Voting Rights Act. Choir sang, two American families made their way to the stage through the memorial. In this place, he will stand for all time among monuments to those who fathered this nation and those who defended it. A black preacher, no official rank or title, who somehow gave voice to our deepest dreams and our most lasting ideals. And finally, there are the multitudes of men and women whose names never appear in the history books. Those who marched and those who sang, those who sat in and those who stood firm, those who organized and those who mobilized, all those men and women who, through countless acts of quiet heroism, helped bring about changes few thought were even possible. By the thousands, said Dr. King, faceless, anonymous, relentless young people, black and white, have taken our whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. To those men and women, to those foot soldiers for justice, know that this monument is yours as well. I feel uplifted and inspired to have and very honored to have uh, been around the same time as this great international hero. I feel very good. People are getting together, we have the same problems and we're, we're expressing our problems, trying to do something about it. I'm very inspired again and go back and teach my grandkids more because I've learned more. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. Can you survive for a week budgeting your meals at a dollar and a half per meal? That's the food stamp challenge that a number of people will be taking very soon. Here to explain the project in more detail is Sherry Trussler, Executive, Executive Director for the Hunger Task Force. Sherry, welcome. Thank you. Sherry, a dollar and a half is what the average food stamp recipient gets per person, per meal. Just who are you challenging to take this challenge and why? Everyone who's never taken the challenge. Everyone who's not currently on food stamps, community leaders in particular, um, decision makers. Um, and those people who I think have a tendency to judge the people who are already on the food stamp program saying that they can make it, that they are just fine, or maybe are questioning whether or not the food stamp program really has any validity in our community. So the golden objective is to make people in the decision making process more understanding. Well, we want people to feel it. We want them to experience hunger, the, the budgeting process, the decision making, the effort and the energy that goes into planning. Um, what it's like to have that little bit of money for food. Now, is this challenge open to everyone? Absolutely. How do you go about signing up for it? People can go to our website, okay. www.hungertaskforce.org, click a center button on our face page, and it'll lead you right to the Food Stamp Challenge. You can sign up online. We're also encouraging people to write about their experiences as they take the challenge. Sherry, as I was preparing for this today, I came across some interesting data. One in three people in Milwaukee are below the poverty level. One in two children go to bed hungry. Just how bad is the hunger problem here in the state of Wisconsin? Well, in the state of Wisconsin, it's probably not as bad as it is here in the city of Milwaukee. Okay. But in the city of Milwaukee, you're right. One in two of our children is going to wake up with no food in the house, hungry, um, maybe having difficulty um, concentrating at school. 
Um, in the state of Wisconsin, we're talking more like one in seven, one in eight kids. But um, the city of Milwaukee is really troubled. And as our state's largest urban area, we should all be concerned. Now, what time of year is your busiest time of year? Here's the reason why I'm asking you this. Here at MATC, there are all types of bins from the Hunger Task Force for food collection. So is this really your busiest time of year here? No, the month of August is our okay. busiest time. What about holiday times? Are you doing anything special for families that through the task force? Yes, we're absolutely going to be passing out holiday bins at Thanksgiving and Christmas as well. Um, we're going to be supporting the Christmas family feast. Um, but I think, you know, let's go back to that month of August. Mm -hmm. The reason why we're so busy in the month of August is because so many of our summer school programs mm. have stopped and all we can rely on are our soup kitchens and the Salvation Army to feed kids on the street. Okay, let's talk about the current political, political climate. Do you think that this challenge will have any type of impact on the current political climate? I'd like to think that it would, but the reality is, is that we live in a very, very polarized um, political climate right now, especially with the state of Wisconsin and the state is ultimately responsible for the food stamp program. Okay. There are forces at the state that believe that there's wide scale food stamp fraud. Some people who actually would like to take people's pictures and place them on their food stamp cards um, to make sure that no one's committing fraud. There's, there's just this feeling that the food stamp program is bad and that it's welfare. And I'm here to say that it's a federal entitlement that it's something that shouldn't change and will not change regardless of the current political climate and that people are entitled to get help to meet their basic needs. Now, you're targeting people in the decision-making process. Would it not make more sense to target more politicians to get them to see what it is actually like to live off of a dollar and a half per person, per meal? Absolutely. Anybody who's watching today should be calling up their elected official, somebody who's they voted for or somebody whose opinion matters to them and say, you should try taking this challenge. Okay. See what it's like. Have that experience. And then you can really speak to it. No, Sherry, uh, let's, let's get into a little more detail here. The hunger problem has been around quite some time. Yes. Do you think we will solve that problem? Do I think the food stamp challenge will? Uh, no, not just the challenge itself, but the overall hunger ordeal. Can we solve the problem? Yes. Absolutely. And just how can we go about doing that? Well, the state of Wisconsin produces enough food to feed 30 other or countries. Okay. Uh, we're the breadbasket of our nation. Okay. Uh, the Midwest is producing tons and tons of food. People throw food away every day, excess food that they have on their plate. We have to make the decision to share the resources that we have that are available widely in our state with all of the people in our state. Make the decision that children shouldn't go hungry. Make the decision that seniors can afford food and medication at the same time and that people with disabilities have the right to eat and be fairly housed. That's not asking too much. You know what, I think this challenge, those who participate, it will really drive that point home, just how difficult it is to survive off of a dollar and a half per person per day. That has to be extremely difficult. You have to make some really tough choices and you spend a lot more time thinking about your food. You have to think thoughtfully about what you're gonna purchase. You can't just put stuff in the cart and say, there it is. You have to prepare your food wisely. You have to combine your foods appropriately and you may not be able to afford all the things you're used to like meat or fruit or vegetables. But Sherry, that means some nutrition, nutrition may go lacking also. That's exactly what people on the food stamp program face every single day. And I think it's fair for each of us to experience at least once in our lifetime. Sherry, if people want more information about the food stamp challenge and your organization overall, where can they get it? They should visit our website, hungertaskforce.org, or they can call us, 777-0483. We're happy to give people information. We are your free and local food bank. We're here to help. Sherry, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Don't Tell Me I Can't Fly premieres this weekend at the First Stage Children's Theater. It is a production based on the life and art of Milwaukeean Della Wells. We'll look at the production next week, but we thought you'd really enjoy this profile of the self-taught artist. Well, I always had an interest in art and actually growing up, uh, my parents took me to the art museum, took I and my siblings to the art museum. Um, I grew up with a lot of books, so there was books on science, history, and there were art books there. I talk a lot about relationships, particularly relationships between women, mainly because I really never had a relationship with my, you know, my mother, and to be quite honest with you, I never had a relationship with my sister, but for my mother, I, it, it couldn't be a relationship because she suffered from schizophrenia. Milwaukee native Della Wells sold her first art piece when she was 13 years old. She then became involved with the Gallery of the Black Aesthetics. 
As a young adult, Art was put aside to raise her son. Her plan was to do art when she retired. She said she was going to paint barns and flowers. In the 80s, she did a political cartoon entitled Nine to Five with Miss Wells about working women. At 36, she decided to go back to school to major in psychology. I told my son, who had, you know, he was 18, go back, get your education. He didn't do it. So I decided to send myself to school. And her advisor said she needed some humanities courses to go along with her academic courses. So she took an art survey course that brought her back to art. She's been called a late bloomer. She says she's an underachiever. One reason, she didn't want people to think she was smart. Through the years, people would try to get me to do stuff because I guess they recognized, but I never thought it. And then, like my older brothers, they were like all valentorians, you know, they're really good at math and science. In fact, one of my brothers had won a full, got a full scholarship from Dartmouth and he graduated from Dartmouth. And one of my brothers tested out of, you know, at U University of Wisconsin-Madison, freshman calculus and physics. But I was like always a late bloomer and I really didn't want I guess it wasn't cool for a female to show that she's smart. But you have to understand, this was, you know, back in the 60s. And then plus two, I got, you know, my two older brothers, I got tired of people coming up to me and say, I hate your brothers because they're so smart. I didn't want people to hate me. Oh. And I think a lot of women, you know, go through that, you know, play dumb. But now that I'm older, I don't care. <laughs> your mother had, you know, the... Um issues with the mental illness. How did that play in your development? Um, because we don't talk about that. No, we don't. And I, think, and I think we should talk more about mental illness. My mother went 14. I lived with my mother. And you imagine as a child and my, you know, my other siblings, she went like 14 years of untreated schizophrenia. So for, for me and the older ch children, and so like my my parents had three sets of kids. It was I, my two brothers, and my brother and sister, then my three young, you know, three, three younger siblings. And I basically saw my life disintegrate, saw my mother disintegrate, saw my parents disintegrate. My mother was a, you know, was a very beautiful woman. I, she was very well groomed. I remember when I was a kid, she saw. And the last three years before she, she, they took her away, and I was about 18, 19 when they took her away. She went to Market County. She had stopped bathing, combing her hair. I didn't understand things like um, she would tell, you know, I wanted to play with the landlord little girl. She said, no, you can't because the FBI, you know, the FBI, you know, the FBI, you can't, the FBI told her. So it was really, it was confusing. I know I, you know, grew up very angry at, you know, at, at both my parents, but I think what helped, what helped me later is meeting other adults, you know, and people who have went actually worse situations than I have. There is a play being produced about a little girl who deals with her family's dysfunction through art. The play is entitled, Don't Tell Me I Can't Fly, and it's about Della Wells' life. This play was selected to be workshopped at the Kennedy Center at the New Visions New Voices, which is a high honor and there are several theater companies interested in the play. The play is really good. A couple of my friends went, and what was interesting to me was the reaction to the audience there to the play. A lot of people said this was their life, because we all think, I grew up thinking everybody was like, leave it to Beaver. I think we all do at the time. I know my son told me once he wished I was like uh, June Cleaver, and I told him, I don't know many women that you know, clean the house in a dress and high heels. The play's title comes from a solo show Wells had entitled, Don't Tell Me I Can't Fly. Because one of the common themes in, in my life is people telling me that I can't do it. And I, like when I first started back, I knew I could draw. And some people say, I never saw you draw anything. Well, you don't have to see me do anything. But, but you know, when I was working at Milwaukee County, one of the supervisors and said, what you trying to do, draw now? And, you know, like six months later, I got my first solo show. But the, I did the title of the show because I kind of identify with people who tell them that they can't do things. And I've met a lot of people who are, who was, and my mother, and I think a lot of my work relates, you know, relates back to my mother. And I think about her because I really didn't know her. And she, she died, she died, you know, two years ago. 
And actually, I learned things about her that I didn't know before. Like my, I always thought my brothers were really good at science because of my father. And he went to market school in engineering, and he was an angry black man. But I could understand why he was angry, but I found out that my mother, she wanted to be a scientist, that she was good, you know, good at math and science, she wanted, or, or a doctor. And um, those are things you don't know about people. And a lot of times in my work, I talk about things how we, you know, how we judge people. I think there are many layers. That's why I think I, I, one of the reasons I do collages, among other things, things are many layers. I think people are much more complex, and we tend to look at the simple. She wanted to be a writer and approaches her work as a writer would a book. Her work, collages, drawings, paintings, and quilts reflect the world around her, be it political, social, or personal. And for her, it reflects for a reason. It's about community, and it's something that I never had as a child. And I think you know a lot of people have, and I think there's a lot of children that's growing up that never have have it. So I actually create a stock of characters in my own land, my own reality. And I used to do that as a kid. I used to lay up in the bed and actually do motion pictures from you know from beginning to end. What do you want people to know about artist Delaware? I just want to be free. <laughs> I mean, I, I just wanted to do me, and you can do you, you know, but respect other people for doing it. That's what I want people to know. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and as we conclude our discussion of the disease and its impact on the African American community, we are joined by Michelle Hinton, Wisconsin Director of Community Partnerships with American Cancer Society. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. The American Cancer Society, it's a national organization. What is the national focus in the area of breast cancer? Well, the American Cancer Society nationally is celebrating more birthdays. And I'm sure people see the birthday advertisement around the country. And what does that mean exactly? Well, what that means is basically we are trying to do a couple things. We're trying to encourage people to live well, to stay well, get well, fight cancer, and advocate for themselves. And so that's what we're doing nationally across the country as it relates to breast cancer, trying to encourage women to get checked, get screened, take care of themselves, live healthier lives. I've seen that promotion both nationally and locally. And so what other things are you doing locally to um, promote healthy breast cancer awareness? Well, locally, you know, this is the month to really energize the, the awareness around getting screened. And so the, you'll see a variety of activities across the state um, for all of the populations around encouraging women, education, providing education opportunities uh, through community outreach, as well as opportunities for, uh, for women to, to, to partake in clinical breast exams. We also see a, a variety of fundraising efforts underway this month to make sure that there's resources available for programs in the future. What exactly are you doing to target uh, communities of color? Sure. Um, that's one of my primary roles uh, with the American Cancer Society. I lead a, a, a team uh, called the Health Equity Department, and we are focusing on decreasing disparities, eliminating disparities in our communities. So what we are doing is we are mobilizing the community through three core strategies, through federally qualified health centers, uh, through uh, engaging community health workers, and mobilizing volunteers, encouraging our, the community to, to be a part of educating our communities directly. So you will see um, our, my colleagues uh, in the community doing education, providing opportunities for clinical breast exams, providing referral activity for women who need mammographies, and that's going on particularly uh, in southeastern Wisconsin, Racine, Kenosha, and Milwaukee. Now, I'm a breast cancer survivor, mm -hmm. and I want to be engaged with American Cancer Society. What can I do, and how, how can I become involved? Sure. What we are trying to do is, you know, providing opportunities for people to become spokespersons, be willing to share your stories with other women, um, serve as mentors uh, with other women who are beginning to go through that process. Um, you can also sign up to participate in one of our volunteer outreach activities. We have a variety of activities going on in the city, um, whether it's a, 
you know, a block club party or a church event or, you know, a Sisters Network hosted an event last week. We are always looking for opportunities to, to engage volunteers to share information through those outreach efforts. So if you're interested, please, you know, sign up by going to our, our website, cancer.org. There's a variety of, of materials out there for people who want to get involved. Well, that's really good to know for people that, you know, would be, um, I have someone in their family mm -hmm. that would be a, a breast cancer survivor like I have in my family, sure. um, someone that wants to be engaged and be supportive. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about um, the support groups that are available for um, cancer survivors mm -hmm. through American Cancer Society. Sure. Um, one thing that we try to do uh, with the American Cancer Society is partner with organizations to make sure that we're leveraging all of our resources. We all have small resources and then how do we come together to make a greater impact. And so we are working with a variety of, of uh, volunteer networks as well as uh, survivor networks. Uh, there is one, of course, the Sisters Network. Uh, there is Brothers and Sisters uh, Fighting Cancer that's under the direction of, of Bonnie Anderson. Uh, then you also have Pink Shawl Initiative, APCD. So we try to make sure that, w that those referral activities and resources are available for people so when they call and look for survivorship information, that we can then help guide them through that with those partnerships. We have just one minute left in our conversation, Michelle. And, and what I'd like to know is an event that you have coming up in November. Tell us a little bit about that and how people can be engaged in that. Oh, sure. Uh, we are hosting our annual, this is our second annual community health worker conference. Well, we are engaging community health workers and that means anyone who is working in the health community, whether it's a lay uh, frontline volunteer staff person or a, a health professional to come and become educated on breast cancer, become a, you know, understand what, what it takes to help educate communities. It's an open to the public event um, and, and free to the public. Uh, so we're encouraging anyone who's interested in learning more about cancer and how to you know, help fight the disease as a community advocate to please come and, and join us for that event. Michelle, there's a lot going on from American Cancer Society and our community. And thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. Faith, it's my understanding you're taking part in the food stamp challenge. I am. I think it's important that if you want to be part of the solution, you really need to be engaged and participate. Well, make sure you keep us updated. I will. Well, that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night.